Welcome to Hayes Memorial UMC Online. The purpose of Hayes Memorial UMC is valuing all people, discovering faith, and engaging community. If you'd like to know more about our church, please visit www.hayesmemorialumc.org.
be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me. I pray, bless all the dear children in thy tender care and feed us for heaven to live. While we wait, rethink. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John worked clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all of Judea were going out to him in all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. And every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, and welcome to Hayes Memorial UMC Online. My name is Joshua, and I'm so glad you're joining us this morning. Um, today, we are in the second week of Advent, and we are in our sermon series called While We Wait. Traditionally, Advent is a season of expectation, but it's also a season of waiting. And in this sermon series, we're asking the question, how are we supposed to live as followers of Jesus? How are we to live out our faith while waiting. Well, let me start by telling a story. October the 31st, 1517, a priest did something that would turn the world upside down. Martin Luther nailed 95 theses on the castle church doors in Wittenberg, Germany. This was 95 propositions of debate regarding the church's selling of what was called indulgences. You see, Luther had people coming to him, showing their certificate of indulgences, and saying to him that because the church took their money, they were offered forgiveness, and they no longer needed to repent. Luther was appalled that this church that he loved, the church that he loved, was selling Forgiveness. Luther even contested the Pope's claimed power to distribute forgiveness himself. This act of rebellion would get Luther into a lot of trouble, eventually even excommunicated from the Catholic Church. But what was it that led Luther to do such a brave thing? Why did he feel the need to correct the church and refuse to recant his statements? Well, it all started in 1515. When Luther was studying Paul's letter to the Romans, because he was teaching it, Luther wrote the whole of Scripture took on a new meaning. This passage of Paul became to me a gate to heaven. As one Arthur would put it, 
The more Luther's eyes were opened by his study of Romans, the more he saw the corruption of the church in his day. And the glorious truth of salvation by faith alone had become buried under a mound of greed, of corruption, and false teaching. In short, it was Luther's study of scripture that led him to rethink everything he had been taught by the church. Luther entered into a season of rethinking his own theology, his own understanding of God. And this season of rethinking caused Luther to reevaluate his life and his actions through the lens of Jesus, free forgiveness and grace offered to him and all people. So I find it fitting this morning that as we continue to prepare for Jesus' coming, our favorite unemployed homeless guy living on insects and honey in the wilderness calls us to prepare the way for Jesus by rethinking. The word John uses in the text is the word repent. And that's a word that oftentimes we are uncomfortable with. He says to us and the crowd of that day, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. But the word in Greek for repent there literally means to change one's mind for the better. Or simply put, to rethink. I think this is an important distinction to make because growing up, this was not my understanding of repentance. As a new believer, the word repent brought images of hellfire and brimstone. Even those preachers that would preach hellfire and brimstone. Ideas of those like Jonathan Edwards, who told his entire congregation, God holds you over the pit of hell like one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire. God abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath burns you, burns towards you like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. And sadly, this was what I was taught to think when it came to the word repentance. That repentance was necessary because if I didn't tell God how sorry I was for every little sin, that he was angry with me. Not just angry with me, but furious with me. Because of my understanding of repentance, I began to believe that God's love was conditional based on what I did or didn't do. And this eventually caused me to have a low opinion of myself. And believe that I was just being humble. Instead, I began to live in the very places repentance was supposed to help me escape. I lived in condemnation. I lived in fear. I lived in shame. And I lived in guilt. All because I had the wrong understanding of the word repentance. You see, I was taught that repentance was for God. It was so that God wouldn't be angry. It was to quench his wrath and to avoid his punishment. God was like a drunk stepfather who was to be avoided and cautious around as not to annoy or irritate him. And Jesus was like the big brother who took most of the abuse when I messed up. But if repentance literally means to change one's mind for the better. If it really means to rethink, then repentance isn't for God. It's for us. The question is, what are we rethinking? Well, I want to start with a statement that John makes to the Pharisees and Sadducees and point out why his statement, even though it is harsh, is well worth our attentiveness. When John saw that many Pharisees and Sadducees who were religious leaders in Jesus' day were coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee the wrath to come? 
bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Let me say this. I think John calls these religious leaders a brood of vipers because John recognized that they were teaching people that the only way to please God was to follow the law, to follow the scripture to a T. And this law that they were teaching included their own understandings and interpretations of scripture and laws. In other words, they presented themselves as religious gatekeepers. They believed they knew the heart of God so well that they knew who was in and who was out, who was righteous, who was godly, and who were sinners, who was worldly. They believed they knew who God loved and who God would punish. And so John says, you better rethink your position to these religious leaders. John's statement beckons us to rethink the ways we consider ourselves to be gatekeepers of the church. I want you to hear how Jesus later describes the teaching of these religious leaders. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 4, he said they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to to lift a finger to move them. I wonder, are there still, are there still people that we put heavy, cumbersome loads upon? Are there groups of people that we continue to put heavy, cumbersome loads upon? Are we still loading up people with our expectations, our interpretations, and our opinions, passing them off as if they are gods so that they bear more weight? And the answer to that is I think we do. And here's the thing. Just like the religious leaders of Jesus' day and just like the Church of Luther's time, we can either use Scripture as a burdened, or as a way of comfort. We can either use it as a weapon to do harm or as a tool to give life. Rachel Harold Evans, Rachel Held Evans said it this way. If you're looking for verses with which to support slavery, you will find them. If you're looking for verses with which to abolish slavery, you will find them. If you're looking for verses with which to oppress women, you will find them. If you're looking for verses to which to liberate or honor women, you will find them. If you're looking for reasons to wage war, you will find them. If you're looking for reasons to promote peace, you will find them. And if you're looking for an outdated, irrelevant, ancient text, you will find it. But if you're looking for truth, believe me, you will find it. This is why there are times when the most instructive question to bring to the text is not what does it say, but what am I looking for? And honestly, I find that the answer to that question, what am I looking for, always has more to say about me and my struggles than it does about who God is. You see, when we go to Scripture with the intent of gatekeeping the gospel instead of self-reflection through it, then we are already misusing the gift of Scripture that God has given us. And as we prepare for Christ's coming, are we willing to rethink our own understanding of Scripture, our own understanding of God, especially the ways our interpretations of Scripture cause more harm than they cause good? And maybe that's why John follows up his vicious statement about the religious leaders with bare fruit of repentance. In other words, John is calling them to rethink not only their interpretation of Scripture, but to rethink the ways the worldview, their teachings, their behaviors, and their actions are actually hurting those around them, even hindering others 
from coming to God. Recently, I found a new social media platform I like. It's called TikTok. <laughs> and basically, it's a way for people to create short videos to share with others. And one of the TikToks I saw the other day broke my heart. It was a guy responding to a comment a Christian made about one of his own videos. The video the Christian commented on was a video where the TikToker explained why he did not believe in God. And so the Christian decided to comment on his video with something along the lines of, you are ignorant, you need to read the Bible. To which the TikToker responded with a video stating that telling someone to read the Bible as proof of God's existence is like telling someone to read Spider-Man as proof of Spider-Man's existence. <laughs> and then he said, your first instinct after hearing I don't believe in God was to comment how ignorant I was. Even if I am wrong, if you are the type of person that God allows into heaven, then I'd rather be in hell with people like me. He's right. The reality is, is what we say and what we do will always show what we really believe. And if we believe God is angry, hateful, and malicious, then we will be angry, hateful, and malicious people. If we believe God is loving, gracious, and merciful, then we will move towards being loving, gracious, and merciful. You know, it's interesting to me that John says we should bear fruit of repentance. Because if you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice, right? If you squeeze an apple, you get apple juice, right? If you squeeze a grape, you get grape juice, right? It would be weird to squeeze an orange and to get grape juice. It would be crazy. It would be unbelievable. It would be on the news. Then why isn't it weird or crazy that when you squeeze a Christian, more often than not, you get anything but Jesus. And if we are going to truly be followers of Jesus that bear the fruit of repentance, then when someone squeezes us, when someone hurts us, when someone offends us, Jesus should pour out. The reason we need to rethink our actions not during, just during the season of Advent, but on a regular basis is because what we do always reveals what's already inside of us. John calls us this morning to prepare for Christ by rethinking how we are to live through the lens of Jesus. Do our lives line up? with what we say we believe, or do our actions reveal dark places that we are in desperate need of God's grace? If we are honest with that question, then it should cause us to rethink our own relationship with God in this season. John puts it this way, he says, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestors. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. The Pharisees and the Sadducees assumed they were in right relationship, right standing with God because of their connection to Abraham, a religious patriarch of Judaism. Now, I wonder what that statement might sound like to us this morning with maybe a little more modern twist on it. I wonder if it would sound like this. Don't assume we are Christians just because we grew up in a religious home. Don't assume we have a good relationship with God just because we go to church. Don't assume we are in need of God just because we consider ourselves to be self-sufficient. Don't assume we've got it all figured out, including God, just because we've read the Bible. Don't assume we don't need to repent 
or to rethink our lives just because we're not as sinful as someone else. You see, if we are truly to prepare for Christ, then we must be willing to truly rethink our relationship with him. And this may also include rethinking what we believe about God. Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Let me ask you this morning. Let me ask us this morning. Do those words from Jesus represent our lives? Do they represent yours? Is that who you are? Is that who we are today? Are we living in preparation of his coming by listening for his voice? By getting to know who he is and by following him wherever he leads us. If not, then it might be time to heed the one who prepares the way for Christ, the one calling out in the wilderness to rethink. It might be time for you and I to turn back to Jesus. If you would, this morning, I want to invite you to close your eyes and place your hands in a receiving position, resting on your lap. I want to end with an ancient prayer called the Prayer of Peace by St. Francis, Francis of Assisi. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope that you found this service encouraging and nourishing to your faith as you seek to grow closer to God, to become like Christ through following Him. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so in three different ways. In person, by mail, or online at www.hayesmemorialumc.org. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and click the Donate button. Please prepare your heart for a blessing. Go in the love of God, in the grace of Jesus Christ, His Son, in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, to be disciples, to make disciples, and to know that you are loved.